Welcome back, friends. And today, let's talk about one of the most popular topics or what was one of the most popular topics in the research space, and that is going to be SARMs, aka Selective Androgen Receptor Modulators. Now, coming back in the years of Tony Huge and Russo and all those guys, you know, maybe, what was it, 2016 through 2019, SARMs took over the space, right? Everybody was using SARMs. Everybody wanted information on SARMs. What are these things, you know, do they really have no side effects? Do they have side effects? How dangerous are they? How safe are they? And now that 2025 has hit, a lot of the hype has kind of died down on SARMs and actually a lot of the community now is very against SARMs and they don't like SARMs. And if you bring up SARMs, you're kind of getting backlash. Now, before I start this video, I do want to clarify that a lot of my sources I have sell SARMs. They sell selective androgen receptor modulators. And this video is not biased at all by that. If you, you know, SARMs are like a lot of these sites really like SARMs are not even the top products I sell. A lot of the top ones are actually peptides. So it's not like I'm making a ton of money off selling SARMs and I'm not even trying to sell you SARMs. You'll see as the video goes on that I'm very unbiased towards SARMs and kind of my view on them. But in this video, I wanted to talk about SARMs place in the research community in 2025, right? Is there still an application to them? Is there still a value to SARMs in 2025? Or are they totally useless now that we kind of know what we know about them and now that we have all of these new peptides and new trends like the GLP-1s and the mitochondrial boosters? So in this video, I wanted to go through SARMs in 2025, discuss the good, the bad, the application, and everything else. That being said, guys, let's dive right in. So first, let's discuss my personal views on SARMs, okay? Now, I've tried a lot of these SARMs before. I've used SARMs. I've pinned SARMs. I've pretty much tried every SARM, okay? Not for full-on cycles, but I've tried them in very, like, many ways. I've never taken them super seriously. I've never, you know, done a full SARM cycle with every single SARM, but my first ever PED I used was actually Austrian, and I remember having an amazing experience with Austrian. I really liked it. I felt mentally really good on it. My joints felt good. I got stronger in the gym. It was super cool. It was also the first, like, research chemical I ever took. So SARMs have a special place in my heart. If anything, you know, I'm not biased by the money of SARMs. It's just they have a very nostalgic place in my journey and kind of the research chem space. But I've always been a fan of the more mild SARMs, right? Things like Austrian, things like S4. I think they're kind of cool. And I think it's like when you're on, you know, maybe a TRT phase or just cruising, they can be actually decently effective options to not screw up your blood work and still give you some pretty cool effects. Now, SARMs start to lose me a little bit kind of when it comes to these ultra powerful SARMs or using SARMs to become a high level bodybuilder. That's where I'm a bit lost on SARMs. And that's where I start to kind of disagree with some of the rhetoric around SARMs. I don't think SARMs are ever going to be or play a role in allowing someone to be a very high level bodybuilder with the exception of maybe injectable YK11, which we'll talk about later in the video. I do see SARMs as being very applicable for women, right? And in the female space, and this makes sense because this is what SARMs were designed to do. This was the population SARMs were designed for. It's funny because a lot of the research space, right, has taken SARMs and has taken their selective uh, action and they want to jack up the dosage so high and use them in ways that they start to lose their selectivity and they're like, look how strong this arm is. And it's like, yeah, but it's lost all of its selectivity. At this point, it's just an androgen again, right? So again, I do like SARMs. I think SARMs have a place. I'm never pro or anti a drug, black or white. I always think the answer is somewhat in the middle. So in the first part of this video, let's talk about the good of SARMs and where I think SARMs can kind of fit into the research base in 2025. Okay, so the good SARMs. Where can SARMs fit in? Number one, I think for older guys, right, who are maybe 40 or 50, one of the most interesting part of some of these SARMs is that they actually have antagonistic action at the prostate, right? Some of these ones, like I believe it's S4 and RAD140, seem to have some antagonistic activity at the prostate. So an interesting theory of what we can do, and remember, at a low dosage of a SARM, is potentially if someone's having prostate issues, cut down their TRT dosage and add in a low dosage of a SARM if you're kind of an older dude, right? This is a very interesting strategy. I've seen it work and I've seen it play out before. And I think this could be an application for SARMs, right? And again, coming back to it, this is why SARMs were designed. SARMs were designed for androgen-sensitive populations, okay? So again, whenever people are talking about like a young dude using SARMs, that's not the population that SARMs were designed for, right? Young dudes are not androgen 
um, sensitive populations. But an older guy who's on tier two who's maybe having some prostate or androgen-based issues may benefit from dropping his dosage down and adding a little bit of a SARM in at a low dosage. Now, a lot of the keys here with SARMs, guys, is to use them at lower dosages. The studies, the clinical trials found that you have to use them at lower dosages, okay? So when people jack up the dosages super high and they lose their selectivity, it's defeating the whole point of the SARM. The second way that I think SARMs could be applicable is for maybe more so the recreational bodybuilder who wants a little bit of a boost on his cruise. Now there's different ways to get boosts on your cruises. I think growth hormone's great. I think it's some insulin, some Humalog is great. I think maybe even a little bit of 100 milligrams of Masteron is great. But maybe if you're someone, you don't respond well to those, you don't wanna use those, adding in a little bit of Osterine or a little bit of S4 during your cruise can be a great way to beef up your cruise a little bit. If your blood work looks good, your liver values look good. Again, I'm not the biggest fan of it, but I do see the kind of reasoning. And I know a lot of guys who really like doing that during their cruises. Again, this is for recreational bodybuilders. This is not for the bodybuilder who's trying to step on the open pro stage. This is for a recreational bodybuilder who's just kind of having fun with it, right? Doesn't want to do anything too crazy. I think they can kind of potentially fit in there. The third way that SARMs are very interesting and probably the most interesting to me out of all of these is for women. Yes, for female enhanced bodybuilders, I do think SARMs have a very interesting role. And as SARMs continue to develop and as we get more data, I think they can be very effective for female-based populations, okay? Again, this is what they were designed to do. If a female wants to potentially use something like Osterine or S4 in place of something like Anivar, I think that's a very fair conversation to start to have, right? So I think for, again, the female population, for the female enhanced population to begin to use SARMs, I know a lot of women who have done very well on SARMs, and yes, we have less data on SARMs than the typical androgens, but at the same time, I think they could have some application there. When it comes to women, I think we still see that SARMs might be helpful because they are more selective than a lot of these androgens at lower dosages. And that's, again, the issue when you push SARMs up too high or when you make them injectable, they lose that selectivity. The final group that I think could benefit from SARMs, theoretically, is enhanced bodybuilders with injectable YK11. I know a lot of high-level bodybuilders who are implementing injectable YK11 and are seeing insane results with it, okay? Injectable YK11 is no joke. It seems like injecting it really unlocks it as a compound and it seems to be very powerful. I know, again, I've talked to a lot of high-level guys. I know a lot of high-level guys. I'm not trying to sell it to you here, but a lot of them are having success implementing YK11. So injectable YK11 could be a massive game changer for some high level enhanced bodybuilders. It's very sketchy, minimal data, but man, I've seen some crazy, crazy stuff with injectable YK11. Now that we've talked about the good of SARMs and where I kind of like SARMs, okay, let's talk about the bad of SARMs, like where I don't really see SARMs as being useful and who I don't really see SARMs being useful for. Now, with the exception of injectable YK11, if your goal is to be a high level bodybuilder, in my opinion, Oral SARMs just do not really have a place in your cycles. You should structure cycles with the basics. Test a DHT and 19 NOR, so test Primo NPP, GH insulin, stick to the basics. That is what is going to get you to the stage. Oral SARMs, in my opinion, have no place for high-level bodybuilders who are trying to get to top-level stages. They have no place at all. They have no application. I don't like them. I, I don't think they're good. Yes, injectable LGD 4033 is super strong, but again... At that point, why not just use another powerful injectable androgen that we know and is more predictable, okay? So again, if you're trying to be a high-level bodybuilder, a high-level enhanced bodybuilder, SARMs, in my opinion, have no place for you. Second group, young guys who are kind of just starting off on their enhanced journey, you know, who want to be enhanced, I really don't see SARMs having a place for a lot of these young guys. If you're in your 20s cycling, I don't really see SARMs having a huge place for you. Again, you're not an androgen-sensitive population. You can handle androgens just fine. What's the point of taking a SARM? Why would you use a SARM instead of using something like TEST, Growth, MAST, Primo, NPP? Again, why, why use a SARM? What would be a point? What would be the goal? To me, I just don't really see a point. I think it's better to use your other growth pathways like growth and insulin, use a 19 NOR, use TEST, use D. You guys would be amazed. I've seen people, there's many people I know who run a gram to a gram and a half of test Primo and their blood work looks beautiful. And then I see guys who run SARMs and their blood work is destroyed, okay? And a lot of them too are oral, which is a major issue in the long run. Cause what are you gonna do? Cycles oftentimes need to be 20 to 30 weeks long. So what are you gonna do when you can only run a SARM for eight weeks because it's so liver toxic, right? It just, it doesn't work long-term. So again, 
I don't really think SARMs have a place for young guys who are cycling. Again, if you're recreational, if you're cruising, you want a little bit of a boost, maybe add in a SARM, but if you're doing, if you're doing your kind of growth phase, I just don't really see a SARM having a place for you. And that's most enhanced guys, okay? And again, I'm just being honest, right? And I've seen the blood work and I've seen how harsh SARMs can be on blood work and kind of the return on SARMs. And I really just don't see it as being worth it. I don't see them as having any unique benefits. Sure. And people always ask too, they say, well, do SARMs work? Can I run a SARM cycle and gain benefits? Sure. But again, SARM cycles are always limited to eight to 10 weeks because they're oral. And at eight to 10 weeks, people get side effects. Okay. So it's like, why would you limit yourself with a SARM for eight weeks when you can run a 20 to 30 week cycle with test, primo, NPP growth and insulin, which by the way, you can do if you kind of know what you're doing. So again, I find SARMs to just not really be applicable for this population. Sure, you can do it. Sure, you can pair it. But again, I just don't really see the point. If you guys d disagree with this and think there is a point of running SARMs, please comment it down below because I used to actually be more pro SARMs. But then again, when I realized when, you know, I realized and I saw the blood work and I saw what all these guys were doing, I just realized that SARMs are so limiting, right? And yeah, they're great, but it's like you get to this weird middle ground with SARMs where it's like at low dosages, they do have minimal side effects, but they're not very powerful. And as you raise the dosages, yes, they become more powerful, but then they bring all the other side effects that normal androgens do. So it's like, what's the point of using it, right? So to me, there's no point for most people to use SARMs. Lean into your test, lean into your DHTs, lean into your 19 NORs, and then lean into the growth uh, insulin axis. You'll be good to go. Trust me, don't overcomplicate it with SARMs. With that being said, guys, I hope this video was helpful in kind of helping you to unpack SARMs and unpack SARMs in 2025. If you're someone who's curious about SARMs or you want to run a SARM cycle or you want to see what SARMs can do for you, by all means, go ahead, run a SARM cycle, go buy a bottle of Rad 140. Don't even use my code. You don't have to. Again, I'm not trying to sell you SARMs in this video, but go run SARMs. Go see if you like it. Maybe it works great for you. And if it works great for you guys, by all means, do it, right? If something works for you, it works for you. So don't come comment and be like, oh, I had a great experience with SARMs, blah, blah, blah works for you, works for you. The final thing I wanted to touch on is guys who are scared to pin using SARMs and like using an enclomaphene SARM combo cycle. Again, this is something where it's like, if, if you really don't want to pin, is an enclomaphene SARM cycle, does it work? Yes, but you're only going to get an eight or 10 week cycle out of that, which cycling is long-term. Cycling is four to five years. Cycling is 10 years, right? If you look at these guys who are enhanced, they're on gear for years and years and years and years. People think too short term about this stuff. So technically, does enclomaphene plus rad 140 work as a cycle? Yes. But should you do it? What are you going to gain out of it? Probably not that much. You might look good during the cycle. You're going to kind of lose most of it. Again, what's the point of being in that weird like middle ground spot? I don't really see a point of it. But I hope this unpacks and I hope this sheds some light on SARMs. Again, I don't think SARMs are all bad or all good. But at the same time, I just wanted to give my thoughts on SARMs and kind of how SARMs are in 2025 and how my views have kind of changed and evolved. Because when I first started my page, I guess I was a bit more pro-SARM, but now I think I'm a bit less pro-SARM. So that being said, guys, for all, everything you need, sourcing, communities, whatever, click the link in my description. Make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And with that being said, guys, thank you, take care, and have a good one.